So Niels, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to meet and discuss with us and also for hosting us on your farm. Yeah. You're Perhaps welcome. you could tell us a little bit about who you are and the businesses that you run. Uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm a farmer. Uh, I'm uh, born and raised in, in this area and I'm, I'm the sixth generation uh, of this farm. Uh, we've been here for just about 200 years. So that means a lot of history, a lot of traditions uh, on the one side. On the other side, I'm also a product of, of modern uh, farming where we uh, develop the business, we develop the industry. So uh, I'm a, also a curious person. I like uh, to solve problems and I like to work with areas I don't know so much about to learn about it. So that's, that's the other side of me, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm the chairman of GLG, <coughs> which is um, um, it was uh, uh, created in uh, 1898, so it's an old company, uh, and uh, we develop it from from a, a farm company providing seeds and uh, all kind of uh, compound feed uh, for for uh, for farmers. Till today, we are uh, we define ourselves as a food company, as an energy company, and a housing company. So that's quite a diverse. Uh, uh, organization. Mm. And then I'm a chairman of, of uh, AP Pension, which is a pension fund in Denmark that uh, they take care of 180 billion Danish crowners uh, where we invest for, for our pension uh, persons. Mm. So, uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm in uh, some of our daughter companies in, in, the, in the boards there as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And um, those three different areas within the DLG group of food, of housing and of energy, they're very, very different. But I'm sure that we'll come to the discussion where there are some common themes that you're also focused on. But uh, you have this group structure that uh, but then you also have um, uh, management teams who come from the industry who are actually driving the food business, the housing business and the energy. Uh, how how involved do you get in the different uh, businesses? First of all, we, we def defined, uh, some years ago, we defined the company for all what the farmers need. Uh, we, de we need basically food for, for, for the cows, the pigs, the hens to, to produce uh, uh, to the country consumer. And therefore we say we are, we are a, a food company. We also uh, want to uh, go into uh, Alternative protein uh, based on, on uh, plant plants instead of uh, meat. Uh, energy. Every farmer needs energy. Uh, so, uh, and also we also need to build uh, something for our stables. If you has to be in these terms, mm -hmm. but but the, the housing is uh, mainly for the German market. Uh, there was uh, a part of of the company we took over, and we found out. It, they were very good at it, and uh, we earned quite a lot of money. So we decided that that's uh, that's a basic part of our company in the future as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and you have a group strategy for DLG, but then obviously there are different strategies for the different businesses, but they're all somehow interconnected. How do you develop the strategy for the group, and how do you maintain it and evolve it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are, we're a big group, we are in 15 countries uh, and uh, we have uh, 6,500 employees, so, so that's quite a work. Mm. Uh, and we, we believe the, the, the value of our company is in our employees. So when we create a strategy, we uh, do it with the owners, the farmers, where we have our board of representatives, where we work with the frame of the strategy, and we have the same work with uh, the leaders in the different divisions, different uh, countries. Uh, and we put all these works together, uh, and uh, then we decide the strategy. And then, then when we have taken the decision, every, everybody knows about it. Everybody has taken uh, their opinion about it. So then it's easier to execute, and it's more efficient to execute when everybody is in it. So, so uh, that's a big part to involve the, the different parts uh, of, the, of the company, the owners, the employees, and also involving the market uh, before we execute. Right. And are there common features of the strategy between the, the housing, the food, and the energy businesses? Yeah, uh, we, we have the, the, the whole IT uh, 
system is connecting the divisions together, uh, getting the figures right uh, from from one division to another to the to the holding company. Uh, so that's for the for the whole group. Uh, then we have uh, CEOs in, in the big uh, companies in, in Germany, in Sweden, mm. Finland. No, so yeah, in Finland as well, uh, and, and the Baltics, Poland. Uh, and then we are in the board uh, of these daughter companies to ensure that we are in the frame of our um, strategy, uh, that we follow the strategy. Uh, so there's, this is a very flat organization, uh, but we are uh, very close to the daughter companies because uh, the C-level uh, leaders in, in, uh, in our group are in these boards and we as well in, in the board I'm sitting in four or five of the biggest companies in the most international ones and uh, other board members are in, in other kinds of, of businesses. So, so we, we, we have the knowledge taken back to the board and that's quite essential to know what is going on and to know where, where, where we have to solve problems or where we have the opportunities to follow and to invest more. Okay. So then we are more uh, agile than, than, than we wouldn't be if we were not there. So you get to, because your organization is so kind of tightly connected, you get to see what's happening at the edge of the, the exactly. business, in the industry, in the fields, in the, in the housing uh, segments, and you can adjust your strategy quite quickly if yeah. something is needed. Yeah, we right. can do that. Yeah. And it is needed. And it is needed, of yeah. course, yeah. many things will come to that. Um, but you also need um, strong leaders to be able to drive through on these, first of all, to identify the strategy, but then to drive through and also to listen to the the teams and to the markets. Yeah. What do you look for in a leader? First of all, we look for personal uh, qualities. I think that's the main thing because uh, you can learn uh, to get better in, in, a, in a certain way, but if you don't have the right personal approach to, your, to how, you would, how you lead uh, your, your employees, or how you lead the company, it won't work. Mm. Um, and then we, we have quite a good knowledge uh, in, in the different, different areas where we are. Sometimes we take Danes to the company, but uh, mostly we, we have uh, Germans, French people and so on mm. as leading the company. And, uh, so, so, um, but uh, we have a, our C-level uh, leaders are very interested in, uh, in getting the right people and, and knowing what, 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 what are their qualities and what, what do they stand for as, as, as uh, humans. Mm, yes. And your leaders, do they move between businesses or do they tend to stay within the... the they, they, they have certain areas where they're responsible. Right. Uh, but our, the, the three C group uh, leaders, they, they, uh, they are involved all over. Yeah. So I was looking into your strategy and, and there's a big focus on cost leadership. And of course, it's not just cost for the sake of cost. There's cost driving growth and uh, all of the aspects of sustainability and innovation. Could you tell us a little bit about how you drive cost leadership across the, gro uh, the group? Um, cost leadership is, is a basic uh, fundament for, for the group to, to, uh, to be competitive in, in the market. Mm. Um, so so uh, that's kind of... Basic, you 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 have to um, to have in, in the right order, but it's also the fundament to to create uh, new ideas, uh, uh, new uh, access to markets, uh, and so on. So, um, I'm 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 in the board, so I'm not in the in the you know the daily daily work with with uh, this this kind of this kind of. Um, of what do you call it, steering the company, but but we followed in the sideline and. Uh, it's quite complicated because we have risk management systems for buying and selling, mm. uh, and especially in these times where, where uh, the prices are so volatile as they are, it, uh, it needs really a, a strong um, system backwards. Um, uh, so, but it's fundamental for creating new value that we have a cost leadership because we have to be uh, the front runner in the market. Uh, we, you don't always have to be the cheapest, but the fundament has to be very healthy and, 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 and cost leading. Mm -hmm. So that's why we mentioned it. Yes. Yeah. And are there some areas where you, you follow, you wait to see which way technology or innovation is going, or in most cases, are you the leader and you set the, the pace 
for change. In most, in most markets, we are the leader. In some markets, we're not. And then we are second. Right. Uh, so that's a different position. Yeah. Uh, but but in in uh, in Denmark, uh, in in Germany especially, we are in a leading position. There are other big companies in Germany as well, but but uh, it's important what we do. And uh, what we've been very interesting in in getting the right logistic positioning, the right harbor positions, because that's that's a key thing if you want to run this uh, low margin business yeah. uh, if you don't have the logistic in the right place yes. you don't earn any money yeah could you tell us a little bit about your philosophy for innovation because yesterday you gave us a tour of your farm and it's heavily automated a lot of robots and uh, a lot of fascinating uh, data and other tools that you use to optimize the business but uh, dlg group is a vast enterprise so how do you how do you find new ideas new areas for innovation and, and scale that um, we, we, we get a lot of uh, input from from the different markets we are in uh, I think that's that's one of the main points that uh, we see some trends and we we follow them but we also follow the trends worldwide ourselves and uh, some years ago we uh, we took some analysis saying that uh, the consumption of meat is decreasing in the western part of the world. It's going to more, uh, uh, what do you call, light meat, uh, okay. and, uh, chicken, and chicken, chicken, and fish, and uh, and also from eggs, protein. So we we decided to go more into this business. Mm. Uh, uh, so the, so that's that's was um, an early uh, decision we took, and it takes time to to turn the company uh, into another direction. Um, and right now we are into the green transition. We uh, we we uh, we said that this is uh, more opportunities than it is challenges for us. Uh, so we have decided to invest uh, in these areas, making business out of the green uh, transition. Uh, and we are risking more than normally because you don't uh, you don't know the market, uh, but you know for sure the market is changing towards the green transition. Yeah. In terms of um, running the business, both the DLG business, but also your farm and uh, driving new innovations and productivity, it requires cooperation exactly. with many outside partners. So could you tell us about your philosophy for partnership and how? Yeah, we, in GLD, we are based on partnerships. Uh, we had a former CEO, he, uh, he created a sentence saying that we are, we are long in, in ideas and or in short in, in capital. So if we want to succeed, we, we have to find uh, partners. Mm. And uh, we have a lot of partners. We've had it for, for some years now and, uh, and that's quite essential in this uh, green transition because you need partnerships. Mm. You, need, you need partners they have that have, they can uh, collect uh, capital mm. for, for, for the business. They have, uh, you can have partners for, for knowledge, uh, you can have partners for knowing about access to, to different kind of markets. Uh, and we have these different kind, types of partnerships and we are also involved as capital partners, mm -hmm. as market partners, as knowledge partners. Uh, so, so this is essential for, for creating uh, the green transition or creating uh, new models for, for the company. What we want with all these partnerships is we want to get higher up in the value chain mm. to get a better income for our products and for the farmers as well. Uh, so, so this is an interesting part uh, that we are very good at. And, and some of your partners are also sometimes competitors. Yeah. So there's the kind of understanding that you have to have of the, yeah. the area of business where you're collaborating and then where you're competing. Exactly. Yeah. The, 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 our, the, the biggest competitor in Sweden Landmann, they are our, our biggest partner mm. uh, in, in Germany. Right. And we have created uh, something we call LDY, Landmann GLG International, where we want to look into the green transition together, invest together, because we need so much capital, we need so much knowledge, uh, and we also need some access to, to markets that we have to go together with the competitors. Mm. We have another company. Uh, with uh, Danish Agro, our biggest competitor in Denmark, we have a hatchery together, 50-50 owned. 
I know that was very fine. So, so uh, we don't look at if there are competitors or not. We look at can we both benefit from this cooperation we have? Can we create something bigger than we had before? Then it's good. Mm. And then we can compete on the other areas. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and as a farmer, of course, cooperation, uh, partnerships yeah. is basically the DNA. Of yeah. The we, that's all, all we, we used to say that uh, in Denmark, the farmers own the value chain from, from uh, the farmer to the consumer. Mm. And that's more or less right. And that's because we're used to these partnerships. We have created the co-ops for slaughterings, dairies, uh, compound feed companies, uh, SDOG and others, uh, seed companies. So, so we're used to it. Uh, and I think uh, we have some great opportunities uh, in the green transition, if we cooperate across the, the food industry, but also with other industries. We have, we have engineer companies, which we are partners with, in mm. creating some factories. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that's essential, and that's, that's also essential for me as a farmer, uh, because uh, I have all these robots. I, actually, I don't know very much about them, mm. but others do, and they can put them up, and I can invest in them, and then they can help me buy making service and so on. Yeah. And uh, the funny thing is that when, when you went into new areas, when I, st I, I bought the first robots for milking for 15 years ago, and we mainly did it because we want to, to, um, to take away the, the manual work, uh, so my workers, they could start at seven o'clock in the morning instead of three, four o'clock, and they could end at four o'clock in the evening instead of seven, eight o'clock. Mm. But we got something totally different. We got this, um, manual uh, re reduction of work, but we got a flow of data. And we can use this data flow in selling our products. We can tell exactly how, how do we feed the cows. We can uh, show it, we can measure it. We can tell the consumers, this is produced in this and that way. And then you can get a higher price, hopefully. Mm. And uh, so, so that's, that's how I see as a farmer, and that's also how we see it in, in GLG mm. and in, in other businesses, for instance. So Transparency we, is, is the key word, I think, today. Yeah. That you can show the quality, you can show how you manage uh, uh, the way you produce it, how you manage the, the animal welfare and so on. Mm. Uh, that's very uh, essential. So when you save time and cost on one manual process in the farm, you allow your, your workers to actually work on higher value things and create new ideas and then... Exactly. Yeah. I, I have uh, six workers uh, on my farm and, and the four of them are, are, are in head of their areas. Mm. They are their bosses on their areas because you need knowledge, you need how to run it. I can't go up and run the things they're doing mm. because they're educated. So when you save time and cost on one manual process in the farm, you allow your, your workers to actually work on higher value things and create new ideas and then... Exactly. Yeah. I have uh, six workers uh, on my farm and, and the four of them are, are, are in head of their areas. Mm. They are their bosses on their areas because you need knowledge, you need how to run it. I can't go up and run the things they're doing mm. because they're educated. Uh, so previous times uh, there were a lot of workers and there was only one in head and uh, the others were just floor workers, blue collar workers. So do they bring you ideas for new types of robots and digitization or and, and then you kind of decide whether it's a, a good investment to make and then bring in partners or I think you've also partnered with universities, for example, and, yeah. and allowed them to do research on your farm. They have done a lot of research and uh, now we have this robot uh, running in the fields and uh, later on this year they, they'll do some research as well uh, to, to measure uh, the, the carbon footprint uh, uh, issue from this field and, yeah. and so on. So, so, and that's, that's very valuable uh, for, for climbing up in, in the value chain, but also to solve some problems for the society. I, I think it's important that if, you, if we as a com commercial company or the farm industry, uh, the, the food industry, can solve these uh, issues, the green transition for the rest of society, we have succeeded. Mm -hmm. And we, we, uh, we will have a totally different access uh, to the market to the political opinion uh, in, the, in, in the whole Western world. So, so we have to solve it. And I think we, uh, we are, I'm quite optimistic because we know quite a lot of this, uh, these business areas and uh, it's more than creating a policy, it's, it's investing in, in some trouble areas, if you can call them that, 
uh, creating green uh, protein from, from grass as we're doing, uh, creating uh, from, from lava uh, protein. And uh, we want, first of all, first we, we want to use it in, in compound food for, for, for the animals. And hopefully we can use it as pure protein for human consumption mm -hmm. later on. Okay. Then we have some, some, uh, solved something very crucial for, for society. Talking about the DLG group, so when you solve one problem with technology or innovation in, in one of the groups, say, say food, do you then look to leverage that into the other teams as well? Or, you know, do, you, do you have a mechanism for sharing leadership in technology in one business into others or into one country into other countries? Yeah, as I said, we, we, we don't have silos or we try to avoid them because then you don't have this flow of, of knowledge from the comp one company to the other or one division to the other division. Yeah, so, so we use the knowledge from the German market. We use the knowledge from, if you, if you take the way we produce uh, minerals and vitamins uh, in Denmark, we take that to the whole group uh, in China, in, in, uh, in Germany, uh, in France. The, the, the diet composition uh, we have in Denmark, we take it from there. And we also take something back if we learn something new in the markets. Uh, we have learned a lot from, from the energy division in Germany, and we can take that to the Danish market. So there's a lot of flow uh, about knowledge, and that, that's, I think that's, that's also essential if you have to succeed, that all the knowledge you have in the company, if it doesn't get onto to other divisions, it, you don't get the worst of it. Yes. So, yes. so uh, that's quite essential yeah. as well. And the flat structure, uh, the, the C group, C group uh, leaders and, and, uh, and uh, leaders below them, they are connected very tight. Mm. They have uh, often meetings uh, where they share problems, share uh, all the, uh, the daily work they have. I think that's, that's essential uh, yeah. and might be special for us in the group. And in the group, or in the, the food, the housing, and the energy business, um, do each of those businesses have their finger on the latest technologies, or do you use partners to kind of give you advice on which direction technology think, is moving? Yeah, I think we have both. We have a lot of, lot of knowledge, knowledge in, in, inside the company, but we also uh, take partners in. Uh, we, we, are, we are planning to build um, a protein uh, factory uh, based on beans in Germany and uh, we're together with uh, an engineer company because they know much more about this than we do. So we take them in as partners, work together with them um, and uh, in other businesses we have other partners mm -hmm. um, and especially in, 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 the, in the energy uh, sector. We, uh, we have a DCC, they own 60% of our business in, in, in uh, Denmark within energy. Mm -hmm. They're specialists, uh, one of the biggest uh, energy supplier in, in, in Europe. So they, they bring a lot of knowledge into our company. Uh, and other parts, we bring knowledge to others. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and as you said, um, the drive towards more sustainable business also brings new knowledge and allows you to create new markets and industries and uh, move in different directions and create new products from carbon footprint savings. Yeah. Is, that, is that the case? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's we, uh, basically, we, when we, uh, four years ago, said we, we need to go into this green trans trans transition, <laughs> we didn't know actually what to do. So we started where we know something. Uh, what is the carbon footprint of our compound feed production? That's where we started. And that sounds easy, but it isn't. Uh, but then we found out you have a very high impact on these uh, productions, and then you can start focusing on it. So that's why we uh, we in, uh, we started up with the green uh, grass protein project, because then we can uh, produce protein with uh, much less carbon footprint um, than than with uh, importing soy. So right now we have a product uh, where we sell uh, the grass protein to our egg company, where we owe fifty percent. And we sell uh, carbon footprint reduced eggs with a 49% reduction mm -hmm. on the Danish market. Mm -hmm. So that's a product. Uh, and we say we don't want to be known for planting trees in Africa, uh, all this kind of stuff, uh, buying credits. We want to make green reduction. Yes. 
So that's that's our main uh, aim to to make real reductions and invest in in new areas where you can reduce the carbon footprint and make a business out of it. That's our drive. Okay. Yeah. Do you get a demands from your customers to drive more in terms of sustainability, but also information about your products and services and their carbon foot? So are your customers actually insisting on this? The, the customers uh, are the farmers, uh, and the farmers sell their products with, with, with milk and, and meat and so on to other companies. And they have, they have uh, needs. Mm. They need uh, reduction. They need that we do it in a special way. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, you, you see it in the market. And, and the, the green grass uh, protein product is, is a good exa example of that. That's a, a defined product we go to the market with. Mm. We sell carbon footprint reduced eggs, uh, and we can also feed uh, pigs with them. We, uh, we do some in investigation about that. Mm. We also invest in, in a, a product together with, uh, with other businesses and, and the University of Aarhus. Uh, we call it X because we don't want to say what it is. And uh, the, 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 the work we have now the, says that we can reduce uh, methane from, from the cows with 50, 60%. That's another product we're working with, um, and um, that's that's how we want to solve the green transition, investing in new areas, going to the market with these products. And what is new? Normally, we say that uh, pol politics is the most uh, most uncertain thing about making business. Now it's the opposite, because uh, now you have uh, an agreement in the in almost the whole world that we should be carbon footprint zero in fifty. In 30, we, uh, we have to uh, reduce with 70% in Denmark, 60% in other countries. And that's why we, we made the, our new um, strategy uh, going to 2030, because now we know there's a market for it, because we've never seen that before. There's, there's a, pol an, a political agreement all over the world that we should be neutral in 50. So we know the market is there, the demand, the demand is there. So we have to be first movers. Mm. Uh, and that's why we're running so fast. Yeah. Because normally politics is the most uncertain part. Today it's the most certain part. Yeah. Um, um, that's quite new, quite a new situation. In terms of being a first mover, do you, do you decide what's going to happen next based on feedback from your early feedback from your customers? Or do you go out and inform and educate your customers about what you think is coming along? I think we take the decision, uh, of course, we, we, we uh, try to find out is, is, uh, is there a market for this. Mm. But if you take the, the cases for X, <clears throat> we just put it into the market. Now we are struggling with getting the, the price higher because uh, it's, it, it is uh, a higher value. But, but if you put things into the market that others haven't, you're one step ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and same for energy. We have to, to make some solutions uh, and put it to the market. Then, then somebody are interested because everybody is focusing on the green transition. So um, you've talked about who you are and about some of the aspects of your business, but what is it in your DNA that really drives you uh, with your leadership style in, in the DLG group? Challenges. New challenges. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think it's uh, interesting when, when uh, you see uh, some, some, some people see problems ahead. And of course, they, they are problems. If you don't do anything, it'll become problems. If you uh, have a, a good and strong strategy and you uh, are prepared to, to look into uh, problems and stuff like that, mm. then you can change it to opportunities. Uh, so that that gives me an enormous amount of energy uh, to to look into new areas, uh, to uh, to look into new new way to do things, and and I don't think it's it's new for for farmers. We did it in Denmark hundred years ago when we created the the, the co-ops. Uh, we were di disrupted by uh, they could um, sell cheap corn from from uh, U.S. to Europe because the, the steamboats were invented. Mm. Uh, so they could do it much cheaper. So we couldn't sell anything because we, we could buy it cheaper than we could produce it, the, the grain in, in Europe. So we had to start up dairies, 
slaughterings. And I think we are in the same position today. Uh, we will have a lot of troubles if we just think we can keep on going like we did the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. But if we seek, think we can do it another way and in, uh, invest in, uh, in uh, these products, as I mentioned before, then we have some great opportunities. Yeah. It'll take a lot of capital, it'll take a lot of struggle, it's not easy, but nothing is easy. So, uh, and that, that gives me a lot of energy mm. to, to see new opportunities. And as a farmer, of course, you're a practical yeah. man. Yeah. So you bring that level of practicality into your, your daily business activities as well, I including think, yes, yeah. other boards as well. That exactly. You yeah. I think that's the DNA of a farmer because you can make a plan Monday and Tuesday, you know, the weather has changed, <laughs> the, the animals um, get a disease or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you work with biological things and, and everything changes all the time. Nothing is, uh, I wouldn't say it's stable, but I think the DNA of, of farming is that you, you always face uh, unpredicted changes mm -hmm. and you have to solve them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And also, because you open your farm to a lot of technological innovators to come in, you get to learn about what's hot in the market, what's coming along. And, yeah. and so when you go into your bigger DLG activities or indeed your other board activities, you have a, quite a good idea of what's possible or what's coming along. I think so. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah uh, because... In, in other businesses, you, you're you working with the, with very, what do you call it, uh, isolated areas where you'll know a lot of stuff about this that can be uh, different matters. But as a farmer, you, you have the whole, from from, uh, from seeding in the field, from milking the cows, from feeding the, the pigs and so on. And uh, the only thing we're not doing, we're not selling to the market ourselves. We have the co-ops doing that. Uh, so, uh, but... Making the daily business, uh, we are used to, uh, to solve uh, unpredicted yeah. problems. Yeah. And also, you, you're very accessible, it, it seems, that you're accessible to the different workers in the teams and on, on the farm. So, you know, you've got no time for these hierarchies and the amount of time needed to get the information up to the, the CEO or the chairman. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's how GLG is, is built as well. Uh, there's a hierarchy, of course, but, but it's a very flat structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have farmers calling our CEO. He, he picks up the phone, mm -hmm. talks to them. Yeah. I don't think you can do that in, no. in all your other businesses <laughs> at that size. And uh, I would say one of the other things I notice is that you kind of act by doing, not just talking about it. Yeah. So by actually uh, opening up your, your farm and your businesses to uh, partnerships and new ideas, then you kind of drive a lot of natural. That's right. Um, some years ago, there was a Danish uh, CEO from, from another company. He said, failure is not an option. And I thought that's wrong because failure is an option. If you don't make failures, you don't get, get you don't learn anything. So I think you have to accept failures. Not too much, not too, not too heavy, but you have to accept them. Otherwise, you don't learn it. You can't go through the, your work life or, or your, your work without making failures. So, so I think you have to accept that if you do your best and you make a failure, then it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you learn from it. I think that, that's also part of the, the, the DNA in, in DOG as well. So uh, what's interesting also to me is this, um, you're chairman of the DLG group, but also of the AP pension. So are there any common themes and things that you, you bring from your DLG day job, if you like, yeah. the farm, into the AP pension activity? Yeah, there actually is because it's, it's so, you, I, I think you, you, you can't find any worlds that they are so different as, as these two worlds. Mm. Because the pension fund is, is based on, on the financial rules in, in, uh, in Denmark and they're, they're quite heavy, really. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's, it's more important uh, that you uh, follow the, the rules than you make business, <laughs> so to say. And uh, so I, I, I use a lot of, I've used a lot of structure we're working with in the AP pension, which is very good and we're very defined into a more loose structure in, in GLD. 
And otherwise, I try to, to take more business into the pension fund to say, we'll, we're doing some business, we have to, to make some money for our pensions. And uh, so, so, yeah, I really use that a lot. Okay, yeah. So that was also why I went into the pension fund, because I didn't know anything about it. What, what kind of advice do you give to new leaders who are coming up in the organization, whether it's in DLG or whether it's in other businesses? What, what are the things that they need to look out for and prepare uh, I think uh, I think it's important to look at, at the quality of, of your employees, what they're bringing to the company, and have a, a respectful approach to uh, the employees. Because uh, almost also my farm, uh, the, the worst of my farm is also in the employees. I know it's in the ground, it's in the buildings, but it's in the knowledge about how you do the production. So you have to focus to develop. Uh, your employees to uh, to listen to their opinions and uh, of course you have to lead um, so but th this this is a, a balance you have to follow uh, I normally say that's the reason why you have two ears in one mouth listen and speak less <laughs> uh, so uh, and, and, and I think it, it whether it's a, what different kind of industries you're looking into that means a lot. Yeah. Educated, educated and, and uh, yeah, good workers, that's essential for every company. And then, of course, access and know, knowledge about markets and, and products is also essential, but that's what, what is in the, the workers. Yeah. And that's, for us, it's crucial in, in uh, DLD when we go to the French market. We were very uh, aware that we had to take the French leadership in first, we had to take the French culture in, let it stay there, and then come into the company because they had the access to the market. And then you can start changing cost, leadership, and all these kind of things. You had to do that, but, yeah. but be careful because uh, yeah. if you break down a good function of culture, you never come back. Yeah, and also they may have some good ideas and processes that you exactly. can leverage in the yeah, yeah, yeah. wider group. Exactly, yeah, that's what we discovered as well. We went into markets where we thought we were the leaders and we found out, okay, mm. they know something that we don't know. Okay, yeah. So that's quite worthwhile. And that brings a lot to the company or the group, mm. you know, all in all. So if I, I was to have a discussion with your employees, what kind of things would they uh, say about you in, in terms of what kind of a leader are you? Well, well, first of all, it's best to ask them, but now you ask me, so <laughs> I, I will say that they would say I'm, I'm straightforward. Uh, I hope they, they will say I'm honest. Uh, I think I am. Uh, so um, normally, as I say, I'm, I'm a gentle guy, but I also told, I'm also told that I can be quite certain if it's, uh, if it's that's the point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So when you're developing new partnerships, you need to get to trust as soon as possible, of course, even before. How, how do you develop trust and how do you sense that this is an organization or a person that you can do business with? Um, first of all, it, it's, it's a matter of what kind of person we're just sitting next to. Uh, and you have to decide, can you work with this kind of culture or, or can't you? And then uh, you, if, if you, you think you can, you start uh, creating some um, uh, some base for for this um, collaboration you're going to uh, into and then then normally uh, if we say we we invite you inside uh, we will give you shares and we don't uh, want to discuss it because discuss if it's 20 or 25 or we want to hear their opinion but if if we have had these nego negotiations where we say we don't want to work with them because if they won't don't want to bring money in it if you just want to take money out, mm. then it's not the right way, but that's one thing. The other thing is that you start the partnership and normally we, we, we have a, a buyout. They can buy us out or we can buy them out. Mm. And, we, uh, and we, normally we go into, in Germany we started with very small shares, uh, partnerships, 10%, 15%, 20%. And today we are uh, 75 shareholders, uh, 55 holders mm -hmm. and so on. And that can happen when you are uh, trustworthy. Um, if you're not, 
we were taken by Azad. That never happened. But we, we bought some out. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also left some partnerships. And that happens, but, but mostly uh, I think um, we, because it's so much in our DNA, that <clears throat> we have a very tight discussion among the leaders, and I'm also uh, involved when we're taking these big steps uh, and have, I join these meetings mm. uh, sometimes to find out what's, what's the DNA of these people, what's the DNA of the company we're going into. This is something that we can work with. Mm. That's quite interesting. It really is. And, uh, and therefore, I think I'm very interested in history. I'm very interested in politics in different countries. Uh, the CEO is as well. And this is, that's a good start. Because if you know something about the country you're going into, and they find out, oh, he knows something about France, he knows something about German history and so on, uh, then we have a, a, a place to start. Yes. Yeah. And where, where you find the really good partners is that then you start the cooperation, uh, cooperation and uh, you, you work with the company together and then you have some problems. And if you can solve them together without arguing, then it's a good partnership. Okay, yeah. Because then you, you have the same goal and you, you have the same direction to go. Yes, yeah. So, so um, you find out quickly. Yeah. In Finland, we go into the sauna to solve the sauna <laughs> yeah, problems. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then afterwards into the cold water. Indeed. But uh, <laughs> on, uh, on the farm, of course, a lot of the partnerships are done with a handshake or, or a, yeah. that very practical kind of level of trust and dependency that you yeah. have on each other. That's a good point. I, I think that's a Scandinavian mm. uh, tradition, uh, that you have this uh, trustworthiness, mm. that you look in your eyes and you see, is it the person I can believe in? And you shake hands mm. and then you have a deal. Uh, that's actually a uh, uh, much, of course we make, we have legislation and so on, but we also have this agreement. Mm. Do we believe in you or do we not? Yes. Basically, yeah. if you go to, to South America, it's totally different. Ch uh, China, you don't believe in, in other persons. That's a totally different culture. So you, you learn the culture first and you have local advisors that also... Yeah, so but, but in Scandinavia, you have this, as you say, you, you trust people and um, I think that's a special Scandinavian thing. Uh, when you come to Germany and further south in Europe, you have more, more legal, yeah, more differences. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. So when you create new partnerships, sometimes unexpected opportunities come up. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you've discovered out of partnerships? Yes. Uh, normally, uh, when you we say we are leading company. And normally when you say that, you, you also expect that you're in the lead of, uh, of the partnerships. But we have uh, some partnerships where we are not in the lead. We have a partnership with uh, G DCC, which is, I think, is the biggest uh, energy provider in Europe. Um, we sold 60% of our business, energy business, in Denmark to them. So we have 40%, they have 60%. We're in the board uh, with them, but they have 60. But today we own more money. Uh, we earn more money uh, with a 40% that, than we did when we had 100%. That's quite interesting. By leveraging that partnership. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that shows what partnerships can do. Yes. So you, uh, you create something together and get a higher value. So, yeah. Thank you. So Niels, you're a straight talker. And sometimes you must come across other leaders in different industries who are not so open to partnering. And they, you know, think that they can do everything on their own or whatever. What's your, what's your findings from people in leadership positions who don't share the same approach as you? That's definitely right. Um, because I think it's in the DNA of many companies that, that the value you have in the company you have to keep to yourself because it's your value. and. Uh, and your, that's your access to, to making money in the market. But in terms of the uh, green transition, uh, where we have to do partnerships across different kind of companies, different kind of uh, uh, branches, uh, I met them. Uh, and uh, it's funny because uh, you want to, to get the good part of a partnership, but you want, don't want to deliver into it. And then it won't work. And uh, I think 
if that'll continue uh, for these companies in the green transition, they'll get some huge problems. Because in, when you go into partnerships, you have to be confidential about your knowledge. You have to share different things. Otherwise, you don't have a real partnership. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I've seen that. And, but I've also seen that there's a movement. But I think it'll take some time. Uh, and I think the, the ratio of success depends on, on uh, how quick they can uh, work together yeah. and share uh, secrets. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so it's, it's quite uh, essential for, for, for a lot of companies if they want to succeed in this green transition, you have to share it. Very good. So Niels, with so many things happening across the DLG group, um, what's, what excites you about what's coming along over the next two, three years? Uh, I'm quite excited about, about a lot of things because I, I think we succeeded, we succeeded in, in the beginning of this transition. Uh, if we don't succeed, <laughs> it's not that good, but, but um, I see so many possibilities because as I said before, we have never seen a market so open for change as we have now. So we could deliver green protein, we can deliver green solutions for uh, fertilizer, for compound feed, uh, for the methane from the cows. Uh, so I really think we have a lot of uh, opportunities to take care of. And that gives me a lot of energy. And I think, because if you go 10, 15 years back, it was more or less, a bit more the same, 10, 15%. But today it's totally different. It's a big change and that, gives me a lot of energy and uh, I see a lot of possibilities. Niels, if you do it the right way. <laughs> Niels, thank you very much for your time and insights. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you.